Welcome to the Chelsea Physic Garden. I'm going to take you around telling you some of the stories, some of the history associated with this wonderful garden. The apothecaries came here in 1673 and apothecaries were like community pharmacists. They have a fancy livery hall in Blackfriars, but they needed a garden where they could grow and observe plants, where they could train students. So this site, nearly four acres, south facing, shelving gently down to the river, was just what they needed. Now in this area of the garden we're looking at early ideas about using plants as medicine and man has used plants for thousands of years to cure diseases. There were all kinds of theories about diseases. My favourite though was the doctrine of signatures. That said that if a plant looks like a part of the body, obviously it will cure the diseases of that part of the body. So over here we have pulmonaria, which has spotted leaves. It's thought that the spotted leaves look like a cross-section of a diseased lung. They would give that to you for respiratory disorders. And in this section of the garden, all the plants have officinalis in their title. Officinalis meant the apothecary's shop. These are the plants that you would get when you went to the apothecary. Now this area of the garden we know as the Garden of World Medicine and all the beds here are divided into different continents from around the globe and growing here are plants that people still look to for their medicine today. Bear in mind 85% of the world still looks to its local plants for their medicine. And over here we have the beautiful Agapanthus in flower. This is in the South African beds and in South Africa the Agapanthus associated very much with pregnancy, fertility and childbirth and the long strap-like leaves were used as bandages. So we're standing here under the shade of our cork oak tree, a lovely evergreen tree. Evergreen trees usually shed their leaves throughout the year. This one does it in one fell swoop the week before the Chelsea Flower Show when we have hundreds of extra visitors who think the trees died. Now this wonderful bark. A tree has to be at least 25 years old before they harvest the cork and a band is taken from around the trunk. The tree is then allowed to rest for between 9 and 12 years before they repeat the process. Beyond me here we have our olive tree. That's the largest outdoor fruiting olive tree in Great Britain. It survived being hit by lightning a few years ago and still does produce a good crop of olives. Now we call these beds our poisons beds and you may grow many of these plants in your garden. We have oleander which we see all through the Mediterranean. Very poisonous. If you threw it on a bonfire and inhaled the smoke you could be harmed. Lovely blue flowers over here of the aconite. A few years ago a lady became known as the curry poisoner. Her lover married a new woman. She invited him and his new wife round for supper, put aconite seeds in the curry. He was dead that evening. His new wife was severely harmed. You'd be amazed at the number of people who say to me, exactly how many seeds does it take? And then we have a very clever piece of planting here. The most poisonous plant in the garden, people get very excited when I say that, but tobacco, of course, having killed millions of people. And on the path over there with the wonderful red spires of flower, Lobelia tupa, and that contains a substance which is used to treat nicotine addiction. So behind me here, we have our grapefruit tree. Now this was grown from a pip planted in 1948 by a lady who only wanted a house plant this thing grew and grew so much so that she phoned the physic garden and said you'd like a grapefruit tree wouldn't you and you know what they say right plant right place it was so happy where we put it it only took 50 years before it fruited now it fruits all year long and we make marmalade from it of course now we know that grapefruit interferes with many m medications we take isn't that strange from a, a very simple fruit
In this area of the garden, we're looking at modern medicines. Each bed here is divided into a different branch of medicine, and growing here are the plants that make the medicines that we use today. Behind me, we have the oncology bed and a large yew tree. Now, you may have heard of Taxol, used in the treatment of breast, ovarian and prostate cancers. And Taxol was first isolated in America. In order to make one dose of the medicine, though, they had to destroy three 60-year-old trees. Then, rather fortunately, it was discovered growing on the English yew, Taxus baccata, and indeed in a fungus that grows on the stems. And so, certainly until very recently, gardens with their great yew hedges would send the prunings away for processing because the process was made semi-synthetically. They needed that plant material to start the process. My star plant of the gardens is this little pink flower behind me, Catharanthus roseus, the Madagascan periwinkle. This is a weed that grows all through the tropics. I've seen this growing in the Caribbean, and in the Caribbean it was first investigated to see if it could provide a treatment for diabetes. Now here we are at the cardiology bed. This lovely plant is Amivis naga. The seeds contain a substance called kelin. There was a doctor who had a kidney disorder that was being treated with kelin. He also had atrial fibrillation. It treated that. I suffer from hay fever, which working in the garden is not much fun, so I buy those over-the-counter eye drops. That is from kelin too. We have foxgloves here, digitalis lanata. In the 18th century, a doctor called William Withering got to hear about an old country woman. I don't know why they're always called old country women. You get the idea. But she gave the patient a mixture of plants. William Withering spent nine years experimenting, refining, discarding, before he identified the safe dose of foxglove leaves to use. Van Gogh the painter overdosed himself on foxglove leaves. That court gave him a condition called xanthopsia. It turned his vision yellow. He saw everything as very yellow. My own GP had a patient who gave themselves exactly that. They misread the instructions on their digoxin. When the dose went back to normal, the vision returned to normal. So here we are at the dermatology bed and these gorgeous reddish purple leaves are the leaves of Ricinus communis, the castor oil plant. Castor oil being a basis for many skin preparations, but I'm sure many people remember the story of the Bulgarian gentleman killed on Waterloo Bridge with an umbrella tipped with ricin poison. That comes from the seed coating of this plant. There is no antidote. Here we are at the main gates of the garden, and the crest on the gate is the crest of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, supposed to show the god Apollo surmounting the serpent of disease, or some such idea. Now these gates are usually only opened on two occasions, when we have a visit from a senior member of the royal family, and when the manure is delivered. Now this area of the garden we call our useful beds. Each bed here is devoted to some different use. Behind me, we have the land restoration beds. So cannas, lovely flowers at the moment, are used to take up too much water. Sunflowers, sunflowers were used after the accident at Chernobyl to decontaminate pond water because sunflower roots absorb the radioactive elements, strontium and cesium. The plant material obviously had to be very carefully disposed of, but isn't that an amazing way of dealing with a problem like that? We have beds devoted to paper and fibres, dye plants, wonderful things, plants still in use today. Well, that's a very short tour of this wonderful garden. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do come and visit us. Whatever time of year you come, it will be a beautiful place to come and enjoy plants.